Hey there, it's that Sunday School Girl of that thatsundayschoolgirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for this Sunday, August 21st. How was your week? That was the courtesy pause. I'm listening for those answers. If you had been a fly on the wall watching me this week, you'd be one tired fly. Because I have certainly put some miles on this week as I have transitioned back. It's back to school and I've celebrated with everyone else. But guess what? It's back to school for me, too. I'm going into my second year of law school. And you all were so incredible last year. You prayed me through. You pushed. You encouraged me. You were the wind beneath my wings. And guess what? I need you once again because it's time to do it all over again. So I'm back and got set up in my apartment. And unpacking is hard work. Oh, my goodness. I was carrying things. I couldn't get a manicure this week. And you know what else? Last year, my mom was here. She was like hanging curtains and pictures and, you know, unpacking the kitchen. And she came back in the spring and helped me put it all up and get it in storage. And then this week I was alone and I was like, oh, this is hard. But I did save the curtains for her. And I'm really hopeful that this week she will take pity on me and come and hang them and make them all pretty. So that's been my week. I'm actually in St. Louis right now. And tomorrow I get to participate in a regional Sunday school rally at the Williams Temple Church of God in Christ. So I'm excited about that. In the spirit of back to school, let me just say that this week I was so excited to make the drop of the donation to Mrs. Henderson Adams, seventh grade class at Eisenhower Middle School in Kansas City, Kansas. And I think there were 50s of everything. There were notebooks and pens in three colors, highlighters and oh, paper clips and everything else that was on her wish list. I was so delighted and honored to be her classroom angel for this year. I am sensitive to the um, commitment that teachers make and often without the financial support of the district to do all the things that they want to do. So um, I was so blessed to be able to be a blessing to her this year, actually in honor of my father who used to do the same. So she was who I chose this year. You don't know who it'll be next year. So just watch out for details as always. And we also announced the winner of Back to Sunday School because it's also a great time to refresh supplies and create awesome learning environments for young people in Sunday school. So I adopted, I opened up the floor for nominations. And I think I received four or five nominations for deserving children or youth classes. And our winner from the West End Church of God in Christ was Sister Paulette Jackson's primary class. And so their shipment will be going out to them early next week. Uh, to be a blessing as they are ministering to children. So thank you all so much. Continue to watch. You just never know when our next giveaways are coming up. And uh, they're always posted on Facebook or on Instagram. So you want to make sure that you're following. Uh, if you're new around here, welcome. Let me slow down and say welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. And I pray that the channel will be a blessing to you. I'm asking you now to go ahead and hit the button and subscribe if you haven't already done so. It is my prayer that the Sunday school lesson will be a place where you have a unique experience with God as you study his word. These videos are done each week for three reasons. Number one, to encourage you to make Sunday school part of your regular weekend routine. So as we're going into the weekend and have these great plans with our family to refresh and relax and all of that, I want you to make sure that we're intentional about being in Sunday school. Secondly, when you go that we're able to participate because we have studied. But most of all, when we leave, we understand how to activate God's word in our everyday lives. So like this video, share it with someone, and I pray that it'll be a blessing. Before we get into the lesson, the last thing I want you to know is that the intentional living journals for the month of September will go up on the site tomorrow evening. I've already gotten messages from those who are in our journaling community and who are looking for the next book. So look for the link tomorrow evening. It is an incredible way to incorporate the Sunday School daily readings into just your regular, your daily habit. Just a moment to reflect on the scriptures and you'd be surprised with just a few minutes in God's word will do to strengthen you and to encourage you as you go into your day. So that's it for me. Let's check out the lesson for this week.
just two weeks left on the Romans road. We've been here together for what will be a total of 11 weeks of this quarter. And you know what? That deserves to be noted because lots of scholars will agree that Paul's letters are challenging to understand. And yet we've hung in here together. As a matter of fact, a lot of this text causes much debate. And there are lots of churches who don't even deal with these texts because they'd rather just avoid what's in them. But Sunday school forces us to really dig in, to learn, and to gain understanding. Now, I say this from time to time, that if you go to Sunday school for six years, you will have covered the entire Bible if you're using the uniform standard lesson. And that's one thing that's really cool. Like No matter what our denominations or what our main services are like, that one thing that we have in common with others who use this lesson series on a Monday morning is that this Sunday, we're all studying Romans chapter 11. So that's really awesome, really cool. And what I like about the whole six-year plan, at least for me, is if you think about it, you're not the same person today that you were six years ago. You've matured in your experiences, in your walk with God, and what you know about God. And we never get to the point that we know everything about God. So that is incredibly, incredibly awesome. So hang in there. And so for this road to Romans, we have been walking through a letter. And that was important to point out because even though we're taking this in small doses, this is a letter, a letter to people that Paul knows. And in this, he has laid out very logical arguments to help them understand uh, grace and justification and relationship with God. Now, last week, we talked about the fact that God chooses through sovereign election, not based on entitlement or bloodline. Remember again that there were both Jews and Gentiles. And so Paul has been writing to a broad audience. And in chapter two, he uses the Gentiles to prove the Jews guilty of sin. But in chapter 11, he uses the Gentiles to assure Israel of a future restoration. And so he shows them kind of themselves by using the other. So it's just a really interesting logic if you follow it. This week's te text, again, he's addressing Gentile believers, those who were not Jews by birth, but who had put their faith in Jesus Christ. So... Some of the writing that we've seen over the weeks, Paul tends to lay out a question and then he immediately gives the answer. So we've seen that in, shall we continue in sin, lest grace abound? And what's the answer? God forbid. Uh, what then shall we say? Last week's lesson, has God been unjust? And the answer was, no, God hasn't been unjust. And here this week, we see another question. Have they stumbled that they should fall? And the answer was, God forbid. The intent of this portion is to show the heart of humility that believers should have. And so our lesson title this week, depending on your publisher, is Grafted In or God Prunes and Grafts. The Bible basis is Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 24. The Bible truth. Belief in Jesus Christ is the core belief, I'm reading on my phone, is the core belief that Jews and Gentiles can be united. The memory verse is verse 22. And the lesson aim is that we will know the details of Paul's teaching about who are the true inheritors of God's promise. Affirm that God has not rejected the Jews and that the Gentile believers have not superseded the Jews, but believing in Jesus is the fulfillment of creation and develop an ecumenical ministry to encourage unity among God's people. Gentile believers had negative attitudes against the Jews. They believed that God was done with them. He had washed his hands. He had withdrawn from them permanently. But Paul's saying that's not exactly what's going on here. They've stumbled a little bit, but God did it or allowed it to get their attention, but that God had every intention on reviving them. In other words, their stumbling was not without purpose. There are things that happen in our lives. There are missteps. There are sinful actions that can be turned into use for God's glory. Now, that's not a license for us to sin or willfully behave in ways that we know are displeasing to God, but it does mean that God can use anything 
to accomplish his will through it. And so in this case, the Jews had been scattered into faraway lands, but they were in places that allowed more Gentiles to hear the gospel message. And that would not have happened except they had been scattered. So if it meant them being scattered for non-Jewish nations to be blessed, that was a win. But how much more beneficial would it be when they themselves would be drawn back to God? Verse 12 says, the fall of them be the riches of the world. It would be awesome if the Israelites would believe on their God. Like they were so proud of him and they were proud to say we're the descendants of and, you know, God made promise to us and God made promise. But how awesome would it be if they themselves would believe with their hearts and they themselves be saved? Paul took his job seriously. He talks about it around verse 13 and he says, you know, what? I really have a great job. You know, I like my job and I give my all to my job. And he, in it, he says that I, I work hard because I want the Jews to see the Gentiles getting saved. Like I want this to be out here and I want them to see it to the point that they, that it kind of stirs something on the inside. The language that he uses is I want, I want them to be envious. I want it to make them jealous. I think about um, my nieces and nephews with electronic devices uh, if you let one have an iPad or the phone, then the other one is in another room. But as soon as they see the phone or the device in the hand of the other, suddenly they get closer. And then they want to look at it. And then their little hands are touching it. And then somebody is screaming, I had it first. Stop. Don't. Auntie, they've got my things. And it's because they got jealous of the toy in someone else's hand. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. I want them to see what the Gentiles have and what they're doing and how, how they're starting ministry. And I want them to, to be prompted to do something different. And he said that the language in the NIV said that somehow, somehow I am hoping that I can persuade or demonstrate and show them the joy, to show them the passion, to show them my experience, that somehow something I will do will be convincing and provoke them to behaviors that mirror what the Gentiles were doing, that God had the ability to save them too. Verse 15 talks about the casting away of them being the reconciling of the world. So again, how amazing it would be. The best scenario is if the Jews themselves would be saved. Then he starts to talk a little more in parables and using imagery. And he talks about dough offered as first fruits being holy. And that had to do with, if you think about harvest time, when wheat is harvested, it's threshed against the floor, the good parts are used, uh, this dough being made to be offered in the temple as a cake. And if the cake going into the temple to be presented to God was holy, then the very thing that it came from, the actual wheat harvested, was holy as well carry that same imagery as we look at this olive tree that this olive tree even if the branches at some point were bad the root is still good and so the root was holy and so the Jews came from this holy root using the imagery of this olive tree the olive tree are, is representing God's people but there were groups of people who were broken off, broken branches, no longer a part of the tree, who had been removed. And these were Jewish people who did not believe. And then he says, and then there were those of you who he described as a wild vine. You're not from the original tree. You're the Gentiles. You're not from the original tree. But somehow God took you when he took off those branches that weren't uh, producing what they should. And you should take up some take some time to look up the words pruned and graft it in a dictionary and kind of read about them. To prune is to cut off something that is undesired. And so those who do not believe were undesired and they were cut off from the tree. And yet you had this wild branch and you were able to take like this whole grafting concept is pretty fascinating that you've got a good root. So you take this other piece and tie it into the good root so it then can start to grow and it basically grows into the good root and that's the imagery that he uses talking about the gentiles being put into this root of this same tree because you want the tree to be productive you cut off the parts that are not desired the parts that are not benefiting the tree the parts that are making it unfruitful 
So again, the Gentiles are like a wild branch and they've been installed into the root of the olive tree, somehow going against everything in nature because that wild root is not a part of the original tree. But again, the olive tree was not producing the way it was supposed to. So the bad part was taken away. The wild branch was installed. That's the grafting process. God took the wild root and grafted the wild branches and grafted it into a good root, which was Judaism. And it was holy. Now, the qualifier for this, for being part of the tree, was not about birth. It was not about blood. We saw that last week. But it had to do with faith or unbelief. And so because the Jews did not believe, they were cut off. The Gentiles chose to believe, they were grafted in. So what should be the response? The response was not for the Gentiles to get arrogant because again, God had not cut off the Jews forever. He was using this to get their attention. The broken branches the uh, had the ability to be grafted back in just the same. And so there was no space for the Gentiles to be haughty or conceited, but should always consider the goodness of God. And he even says, Paul even says that you stay grafted as long as you continue in goodness, because if you don't, God can cut you off too. So at no point are we ever in a position for conceit or haughtiness or a holier than thou attitude when we realize that God has grafted us in as wild branches into a good root. He does that so that we can be productive, but not so that we can say that we're wonderful. And also, if you are cut off, you can be grafted back in. It doesn't mean you're gone forever. It doesn't mean the bad pieces are gone forever, that God has the ability to graft back in. And that's a wonderful thing because it says to us that there's never a point that we're so far away that we can't come back. We should, again, be mindful, be careful, because it's possible to be cut off. We should walk carefully and not commonly with God. Don't ever get into a place where your worship is just a ritual and just something that you do. We have to be mindful every day of the relationship. And Paul writes us, if we continue in his goodness. So there's something that we have to do every day, all the time. It's active. Our relationships are intentional. Here were my learnings from the week. God is not just concerned with how we start, but he is concerned with every part of our lives and how we live. The beginning, the middle, and the end. He's concerned about how we live this out every single day. Next, to remember that we do stumble but there is no stumble that we can make that is beyond the ability to recover. And we can always be, always be grafted back in. But that's a matter of us coming back to God and being humble and being desirous to be back in relationship with him. And when he does put us in right relationship, it is not for us to be arrogant. It is not for us to be holier than thou. It is not for us to run a church resume. It's not to get credit for the things that we do. We should never be common with God or take his mercy for granted. And we should never believe that we are allowed to live any way that we want to live. But there is a way that seems right to man, but the end is destruction. And so we must be mindful of walking in ways that please the Lord. And lastly, no matter how far away the branch strayed, remember the root is still good and we can always get back to the root. That is the lesson for this week. I look forward to your comments. I know your lesson studies will be great with your classes. So if you have nuggets even after class on Sunday and you want to leave those in the comments, I would love to read them. And if you leave me some early, there'll be some that I can incorporate into class on Sunday as well. So that's it. Have a super fantastic weekend. Don't forget to share this video with someone. And if you haven't done so, don't forget to subscribe to, to, subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend and I'll see you next week. Bye.